Thank you. So we'll just get started. Um, as I was saying, we always like to get to know who you are as people before we really get into the details. Um, so each of you, please, in whatever turn you like, tell me where and when you were born and a little bit of your life growing up. All right, I'll go. I, uh, I'm Elizabeth Slaughter. I was one of the very few people that was actually born in Corona, not in a hospital, but born in a house in Corona. I'm one of six, and when you're number five of six, the doctor basically says, we got this, right? And so I was born in my parents' bedroom uh, on 112th Street in Corona. And uh, a couple years later, we moved around the corner where we spent the next 40 some years until my mom uh, eventually moved to Florida. So we didn't leave Corona until perhaps 1994, having, having been in Corona in, since the early 30s. So all of my brothers and sisters went to the same school. Uh, our names were confused, uh, which happens, I guess, when you're one of six, except I don't know why they would call me the boy's name, but they did. But uh, I got away with a lot, safe to say. But uh, I had a wonderful childhood, and growing up in Corona uh, was just a great opportunity that few people have an opportunity to, to experience. If you don't mind, what was, what was great about it? Share some well, specific memories that kind of stand out. Uh, it was a time, and I think many people can relate to uh, a time, the, the 50s and the, the late 50s, when things were j just different. When the co-op that we moved to was being built, the Dory Miller Co-op, which was the first African-American, predominantly African-American co-op in the country. When that was being built, I was not quite in school. I was in kindergarten. And so at lunchtime, I could go sit with the um, workers and have lunch. You know, that was across the street, and that was considered, you know, just a fun thing to do. Uh, when we moved to Dory Miller, which was, many people have referred to it as Mayberry, because there was no drama. Nothing, nothing really ever happened there, other than parents watching children, uh, children playing with children. There were no distinctions made. As I mentioned, it was a primarily African-American uh, community, but we had children of all backgrounds, uh, Christian, Jewish, all types, and there were no distinctions made other than if you were not good at jump rope, that was a distinction, or if you were not good um, at playing softball, that was a distinction. But those distinctions that are made nowadays we just weren't made back then. We were one community. The parents all worked. It was, uh, I, I guess, in moving in, into a, um, a co-op, you had to have a, a stable uh, work history. And so the people that were moving in there were from all over. They came out of, uh, out of Manhattan. They moved from other parts of the country because this was a, a very special place to live. So everyone worked. All the parents worked, which meant that... Um, our vision of growing up was that you work, you work. And so um, there were a lot of interesting things that happened uh, in the course of growing up there. We didn't have, our school didn't have a library, but the uh, bookmobile came to our co-op. And we thought that that's what we deserved because we thought that that's how it was. So there were a lot of things that growing up there, standing up to people, speaking your mind, having seen, seeing our parents uh, head the NAACP fighting for certain civil rights, that was our vision in growing up and that's what was imbued within us in growing up. And in, as we started our own work career, I would say it was at times problematic because we didn't understand that there are times when you should back up we always move forward, and that was that was our model, and that's how we uh, that's how we were trained in growing up, and that that was mainly my my growing up there. It was different. It was different. I'm going to interrupt for a second. Yeah. I'm getting a lot of crinkle from the paper. Uh, 
Uh, if, I'm so sorry. If, I'm, I'm going to give I'm you a chair. Right? Yeah, that's perfect. But if you need to refer to it, that's not a problem. Okay, I'm great. Good <coughs> Um, so tell me a little about your life growing up and when and where were you born? Okay, well, unlike Liz, I wasn't born in Corona, but my family lived in Corona since the early 30s as well. I was born physically in Flushing Hospital, which was the closest hospital, but I lived in Corona since birth, as did my other, we had, we had a large family as well, there were nine of us, and so it was a great thing. Having brothers and sisters, I never could imagine how people that single family or one child family is it's just a figment of my imagination, but it's a great experience. Uh, so my family has lived there. Well, on my father's side, he came in the 30s. But my mother and her mother and father, and they were born all in Queens in Flushing, so which is the next neighborhood. So I can go back probably 150 years or so being in Queens. Both parents, both grandparents on my mother's side, so we were always lived in Queens, and so it's a, a wonderful, great experience. My grandmother used to talk about it when she went to school, uh, walking through the, uh, <clears throat> the rain-filled dirt road to to go to school and her older brother carrying her on the shoulders if the snow was too high and that sort of thing. So we've been in Queens a very long time and in particular Coney East Elmer's, I went to a school which is specifically down the street from where Liz grew up, which was 143. I was there when they were building elementary school when they were building Dory Miller. I attended 127, which is a on the East Elmhurst side, and that's where I went to junior high school. So, been in Queens a very long time, and I wouldn't live anyplace else. You mentioned um, how much you love having siblings, so I was wondering if you could say a little more about who they were, what kinds of things you would do together. Didn't I go to school with one of your cousins? Loretta, I think. Loretta, Loretta. Yeah, yeah, right, right, correct, right. So, yeah, my, my father had two brothers who also lived in the community, so we probably half populated all the colonies <laughs> always because there was probably about close to 20 kids between the three families. Oh, wow. And you, I'm sorry, I forgot the oh, question. Oh, just, you, you, you spoke very highly of having siblings, so I was wondering if you could tell me some specific memories about that, who they were, what kinds of things you do together. Okay, well, I guess one of the biggest things when you have sort of like stair steps, you learn and know everybody because somebody, no matter where you went, somebody knows your brother, one of your brothers or one of your sisters or multiple of them. Matter of fact, just this past weekend when we did our walking tour, somebody I didn't know came from Staten Island because he you know, read about it, saw it on Facebook, and he came to attend the walking tour. And the first thing he says, Lorraine, are you Richard's brother? And I said, yes. So then he says, well, he was my sister's first boyfriend. I said, oh, is that right? Now, I don't remember him or his sister, but that sort of thing happens all the time, so when you have that. And so the block where we lived, which is, we always have this borders dispute between what's the starting line and ending line of Corona and East Homeworks, because it, it changes with the post office, who's in the mayor's office, it's never consistent. So where we lived on 107th Street between Northern and 32nd, sometimes Northern was the dividing line, some people said 32nd Avenue, people was. So on that block, there must have been 60 houses. We knew everybody in every one of the houses because our brothers and sisters, we were all playing on the blocks. And we had the largest family, but there were one or two that were quite close. So you probably had over a hundred children living on that block. And I, <clears throat> well, I'm a lawyer now. I went to law school late in life. And one day at the law school, there was a seminar, and this judge was speaking. That was a judge that grew up on my block. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't seen her in 40 years or so, I guess, something like that. So it's just those sort of things. When you have siblings, they tend to multiply your relationships in the community and with other people. 
if I could add something to that, as as opposed to where I grew up in the Dory Miller Co-op, there were kids there. And so for us, we rarely went outside of that community because there were six buildings and probably 200, 300 kids. And so there was never a need to go beyond the borders of where we grew up, which, you know, in some ways is kind of a limited world, but that was the only world that we knew. We all went to the same school. We all went to the same high school. All parents knew one another. And it was a very, uh, I, I, it was a tight community because the children and the parents and the buildings, and we were a little bit separated from the rest of Corona just by virtue of the way we looked. We were six buildings all together with a, uh, a common area in the center. And so there was no reason for us to go beyond. I would tell people that uh, Nor uh, Dory Miller was at the corner of Northern Boulevard and 114th Street. I don't think in the time that I lived in Dory Miller, I went beyond 108th Street. No reason. I, I wouldn't, I, there was no, nothing for me to go to. So it was just, it's kind of opposite. You knew everyone and I knew that little circle of people, the big circle, sort of, in Justin Dory Miller. Strange. It was made better. It was. <laughs> it was. I mean, nothing bad ever happened. What, um, how did you guys come to learn about the history of the area? You know, famous people living in certain homes, or, you know, you had this you know, wonderful family history going back that gave you that long memory, but... As you learned about the history and as you um, began to internalize it, what did that history mean to you or signify to you? Well, it started with, I would say, um, my brother, one of my brothers, uh, graduated from Annapolis. And he was the first African American in New York City to receive a congressional appointment to Annapolis. He went to 143. He went to the public school, he went to the local Catholic school, and everyone knew him. Sadly, a few years after he was, uh, he graduated, he was killed in, in the plane that he was flying in. And this was a very big deal to Corona because everyone made the papers and, you know, he's Annapolis, Annapolis, that's a big deal. And because of his passing, because of his tragic death, there was a medal, an award given by the local public school, public school 143, in his memory. And for several years, that medal was given to the student with the highest character or grades or something like that. As the changes happened at 143, meaning different uh, principals, different administrations changes, things got lost, and the medal somehow was no longer given. We were informed from, by this by a former teacher that the medal was no longer given. And with that information, our current president of Coroni Stellenhurst Historical Preservation Society said, oh no, this can't happen. This is part of our history, and that's where it began. Carol Drew Peoples began the fight to not only restore the medal, but to also shine a light on the Corona and East Elmhurst history. So with that small tragedy grew the enormous interest and desire to maintain the history of Corona and East Elmhurst. And that, to, to, the, to honor Carol Drew, that was her pushing pushing to make sure that that happened. And the award is given now. That's wonderful. And that's, that's how we began, I believe. Tell me a little bit about who your brother was, uh, what he was like. He was, um, as I said, I'm one of six. My brother was. My brother, Kent, Kent Slaughter, was one of six. He was number f five, four. He was number four of six, if you start from the bottom. 
youngest, da, da, da. he was number four. Uh, Kent was number four on the bottom. In any family, even though there are six, there's always somebody that's uh, sort of first among the six or first among the three. There's always somebody that's a little bit stands out. Kent Slaughter stood out. Kent Slaughter was the one that got the awards. He was more of a leader. He, uh, he went to Brooklyn Tech uh, after Our Lady of Sorrows Catholic School. He went on to and got the congressional appointment, as I said, to Annapolis. Well, that sort of stood out in the community. And even though when he would come home from uh, Annapolis, he would, my mother would say, put your uniform on him and, you know, walk in the street with your uniform on him. <laughs> and Kent would say, nah, nah, these, the people that he grew up with in Corona were, um, how do you describe the, the Northern Boulevard? It had a variety of characters. But he enjoyed the main, the main and main strip. That was the main strip. Main strip. Northern Boulevard was the main strip, and he enjoyed the variety of characters. Um, at any time of the day or night, you could take a stroll on Northern Boulevard, and uh, those characters would be available uh, for whatever you have, whatever. And but Kent enjoyed that environment. So for him, putting on his uniform and uh, walking down the street was just not something he was going to do. He was really one of them, but stood out in the fact that the whole community knew that he was first in New York City to get a congressional appointment to Annapolis. So um, he, was, uh, he was quite a bit older than me, um, but paid attention to me, <laughs> which was nice. Interesting uh, that he was class of 57 at Annapolis. And his class had their 60th reunion, and they invited myself and my brother Lance, my younger brother Lance, to the reunion so we could meet uh, the rest of his classmates that came. It was a wonderful opportunity. And um, I presented them with a video that I had of the graduation from 1957 that my father had taken. And um, they were just thrilled to have us there. So it was, it was a wonderful. But, Kent was uh, first among six. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'll ask you the same question, and I'm not, I'm not as interested in the formation of the group, we'll get to that. I'm sort of interested in how you came to be aware personally of the history around you and, and why it mattered. Well, I guess for a couple of reasons. One, I was not a very attentive child in the sense of knowing everything that was going on around me. I just enjoyed it or didn't enjoy it. So I was never thought much of who the person was in their terms of their stature, but more did I like that person or I didn't like him, okay? And so, for example, there was this one man that lived directly across the street. He, he had probably the biggest house on the block and he had a plot of land next to him. And we were always out in the street playing ball or whatever, and the ball was always going on his lot. And he was the meanest guy on the block, probably the only mean guy. So he stood out in that sense. But as I got older, I, you know, people would say, you know, Howie Balafonte lived here, and I knew about Malcolm X, he lived in the neighborhood. I learned that um, Jimmy Heath lived in Dory Miller, and his brother, and Nancy Wilson lived there, and Cannibal Adderley. You know, and I'm a lover of music, and, and that so sort of began to open my eyes and start thinking about what have I been missing all this time in terms of these people. I was enjoying being a kid, and that was enough for me until I got older and began appreciating history, et cetera, et cetera, music, and saying, how did I not know that Jimmy Heath, who still lives in Dory Miller, was, was living there, you know? so. It's sort of a, an awareness of the community at the same time, my own general awareness of what was going on in our country, in the world, and certainly in the neighborhood. So, and actually, when I moved away from the area specifically, I still always went back there because I still have many friends there, I began to appreciate it more because I had a more reflective approach as opposed to 
understanding as I was growing up. When did you realize that the former Attorney General, Eric Holder, was in your community, was from your community? Well, I knew that uh, a while before. I didn't know him, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't know his brother. I met his brother, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that, but I, I thought that was a great thing as well, yeah. that the fact that uh, he came from the community. Very uh, likely guy, apparently just as his brother, he, he came to uh, the founding members of our society. They were part of a group that had these unions every two years or so, and um, Eric Holder came at the last, he came to, was it the last one, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, he yes, came at the last one, came. you know, sure. while he was still in office. And stays in, in contact, contact right, yeah. with, uh, with the community. It was interesting when I was reading something about Eric Holder in, I think it was Time Magazine, and it said that he, uh, he came from a uh, low-income community. East Elmhurst was not a low-income community. People owned their homes. And so it was surprising to see it referred to in that way because even though there was Corona in East Elmhurst, there was Corona in East Elmhurst because East Elmhurst had homes, nice, very nice homes with backyards, and Corona was often um, walk-ups or apartments or... Two and three family. Two and three family apartments. So it was odd to hear that Eric Holder's growing up referred to as... as uh, uh, low income that was not at all, <laughs> not at all. So yeah, that was sort of a distinction between Crony and East Elmhurst, even though we don't think as a society, and I think most people in general, we think of it as one community. But there is, a, there is, there is that difference. When I went to 143, well my family was poor, okay, so I'm letting that be known. And so if somebody said that we came from a low-income family, I'm okay with that because it was true. But there was that distinction. So when I went from attending 143 from kindergarten through sixth grade, which is what all, all my brothers and sisters went to the same school, they all knew every one of us, all the same teachers. teachers. Yeah, but right, the same teachers. And we went to 127. Uh, it was a difference. Now, my newly found friends, were all lived in single family homes, they were well to do folks, you know, so that was a middle class community. And so that was the distinction, but most people don't see, that I know of, don't really see that distinction. And I realized how false a distinction it was, but some people didn't utilize that, but I didn't think much of it. Uh, my friends were my friends, I had I always called Northern Boulevard the Mason-Dixon line, which right. is between the two, because that was the sense that was in my head. But playing sports and being in a community, every team I was on, it was quote-unquote people from Corona and people from Corona and East Elmhurst, and we all acted like there was no distinction mm -hmm. I never went to East Elmhurst, though. You never did? I never went beyond 108th Street, remember? Yeah, you did say that. that. <laughs> I can't believe that. <laughs> I was all over. I've, I've walked so much and so in all the different um, areas of uh, Corona East Elmhurst. Now, East Elmhurst itself is probably smaller geographically because the LaGuardia Airport takes up a big part of that. Um, that. So geographically, it's probably smaller. Corona goes all the way south to almost the uh Long Island Expressway. Mm -hmm. So it's a larger area and it's, pro Corona would be more diverse in terms of its architecture, its structure, um, the uh, makeup of the um, people who live there because it's just larger and the houses are more variable. The one that Corona East Town is mostly single family homes. That's the largest makeup. And Corona, the part that we're talking about is really North Corona, the part that uh, started out as primarily German, Italian, uh, Dutch, and African American. That was North Corona. That's the piece that's closest to uh, City Field. That's North Corona. South Corona was solidly Italian and for the most part remains 
solidly Italian. And so that was a real distinction, whether it was North Corona or South Corona. Though, uh, people were welcomed, I think, well, we were, we were welcomed in South Corona. I don't know if South Corona was welcomed in North Corona too much. But it was a time that people, you know, were looking to guard their, their turf. Right. You know, kids. And so, but what did I know? I was in Dora Miller. <laughs> I only yeah. heard about it. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about how um, not just the community has changed over the time that you've seen it grow, but also um, physically how it's changed, how, how it looks different, how the buildings have changed. Well, a lot of, again, we did the walking tour. This is our second walking tour we did this past weekend. And some of the, I mean, a lot of places, I'll use Northern Boulevard as an example, I, would, I knew every store from, say, 110th Street Northern Boulevard, all the way to Junction Boulevard, 94th Street. Okay. Now I know almost none of them. And not just because the owners of the stores have changed, but most they've torn down buildings and put up these tall, narrow buildings where you had a, a 20 foot, because that's about the average size of most small buildings is about 20 feet wide, and they now have a six, seven story building 20 feet wide. And on this one block we looked at when we were going to our last stop, we used to have this theater, movie theater, which I used to go to almost every Saturday morning, five cents to get in, get a ticket for a prize, you see 10 cartoons, and two movies, full length movies for a nickel. And the name of the theater was The Palace, but we had it nicknamed as The Dump <laughs> for various reasons. You used to have a matron there when why? you went there on Saturday morning. Why was it called The Dump? I really don't know why. It was heaven to me, but <laughs> it was the nickname. <laughs> and so, and, and on Saturday mornings, we would have a matron there. She would be in a white dress, and all the kids had to sit in a certain, the front section of the theater. And when you left out of there, when the cartoons were over and the two full-length children's movies were over, you had to leave. And she had a flashlight and she made sure you left. So when I would leave, if there was another movie I wanted to see, I would sit down there with the adults. I'd pick out somebody I knew because I almost always knew somebody and I'd sit next to them so I could watch it. The point I was making about this building is that it's no longer there. I was standing out there on Saturday afternoon and I'm saying, Where's the dump? Where's the dump? And they had torn it down. I was there about three years ago because that turned into a church. It turned into a church. And a friend of mine, a large family from Corona, there were 11 of them. They lived on 108th Street in Northern Illinois. Their father had just died. I think he was 94 years of age. And so I was there for the services. So I was in the building. It was no longer the theater, obviously, but it was a church. And now it's gone and there's a new building built there. So the changes are just massive. I, you can't even t I can't tell which buildings were what anymore. I actually had to ask somebody, am I on the wrong block? Wasn't that where the dump was? The only reason I knew was because someone helped me remember and there was a, a funeral parlor there and there's a young lady I grew up with. Her father was the owner of the funeral parlor. And that's a church as well, but I knew where that was. And I knew the dump was the next corner, and it wasn't there. So a lot of changes, so the development in the neighborhood, they're not concerned with any of the historic stuff. No concern whatsoever. They just tear down. And well, the, the neighborhood, not, not just the neighborhood, but uh, Corona and East Elmhurst, that from north to south, has changed dramatically. Uh, it was, as I said, primarily, Corona was primarily Italian, German, African American, and Dutch. And it, with, as, as evolution happens with, with all neighborhoods, it, over time, it changed. And there, it's now become primarily, North Corona at least, primarily uh, Latino, right. Latino community, and fully 
in a Latino community. And Flushing, where you went to school, is an entirely uh, Asian community. Entirely. And so it, it happens with time that, that neighborhoods change. It's happened in Brooklyn, it's happened all over um, New York and in other places. And there's really no way to stop the evolution of people moving from one place to another. But what our organization, Caroni Stelmhurst Historical Preservation Society, intends to do and hopes to do is to, is to preserve what, what has been so that for the people who are coming and for the people who are there and for the people who have passed on, there's some legacy to understand why this place is the way it is why Dory Miller is the way it is, why, where um, Dizzy Gillespie lived, who is Dizzy Gillespie, why um, a certain house is named after somebody. It's, even though there's evolution, there has to be education and learning so that people have a full knowledge and enjoyment of why they're in a certain community. You would never want to live someplace and know nothing about it. When you travel, you, you sightsee and you want to learn things. So when you move to a place, a new environment, you, you want to learn what's happened, who was there, what's important to this community. And that's what Caroni Stelmhurst Historical Preservation Society is trying to do. Maintain, promote, educate, um, uh, have tours where people can see what's going on, learn about. When we had the walking tour this past weekend, we had people from all over New York City come. People from, they were from Brooklyn, they were from the Upper West Side, they were from all over simply to learn. And it's been a wonderful experience as I walk with people who, there was a lady I was walking with who came from Sheepshead Bay. Just curious, because she'd heard about Caroni Stelmhurst, knew nothing about it, and wanted to take the walking tour. It's also become a, a great opportunity and a great um, uh, uh, joy for people, let's say, who are retired and like to walk, walk and learn. And that's what they've, uh, there was another couple from the Lower West Side, just came to learn. And so Caroni Stelmhurst Historical Preservation Society is championing, 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 you know what I mean. You can say that sentence again if you want. Championing. 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 I can't say Championing. Championing. Gotcha. <laughs> the effort so that people can learn about this community, can find out the, how the famous people. Madonna lived in, in Corona. Who knew? Um, uh, the first African American to receive a PhD, Marie in, Daly, in chemistry. In chemistry, lived, grew up in Corona. Uh, Malcolm X. Uh, there are just so many people that this community is enriched by their history that it's important to to know about it. So we, we go into the schools, we go into the churches, we go to tours, we go to speaking engagements, and we make an effort for people to learn. And we hope that people will join our, in our effort and join the Caroni Stelmhurst Historical Preservation Society, which is a 401c3, 501c3 organization, and help us look for other ways that we can establish uh, learning about the about the community. Uh, it's interesting that, uh, and I think you alluded to it, that the borders, the boundaries have changed, and for in part, developers have changed those boundaries. I've heard East Elmhurst referred to as West Flushing because East Elmhurst maybe was not well known, and but Flushing is and it maybe will attract more people. Uh, the area that's next to Corona is Jackson Heights. And so the Corona boundary keeps moving west to include Jackson Heights so that the developers can say, it's Jackson Heights. 
and you know because Corona has a different um, perception. It's the perception is it's primarily Hispanic, and so if you move the border to include Jackson, call it Jackson Heights, you'll you'll um, you'll invite a, a different type of people to come, and so it's really the developers and even the LaGuardia Airport. Uh, that whole area is solidly East Elmhurst, but because it's got those big houses that overlook Flushing Bay, um, the developers are seeing that as an opportunity to create a different environment and call it something else. Is that right? I certainly agree. Sure. It's really taking place. It changes the, the zip codes, the moving yeah. the blocks. You know, one of the churches that is two blocks over, they have it, uh, 94th Street and 96th Street. Well, 94th Street was basically the borderline for Jackson Heights, mm -hmm. okay. Now there's a church that's on 96th Street, two blocks away, now they're trying to call that Jackson Heights. Yeah. And it is part of it. I mean, anytime you have Heights in the name of your, <laughs> where you live, it adds a certain... Uh, Cache. Right, yeah. exactly. Brooklyn yes. Heights, Jackson right, Heights. Yeah. So, but all of that was actually Corona, actually in, in its history, East Elmhurst was part of, was Corona, it wasn't, it was, developers also did that years ago, okay, in the same that, um, just like Nassau County was actually a part of Queens County before that was changed and separated. So we have all these things and it's still being done that it brings dollars to developers when they can say what it is and what they want to say about the place. So that's part of the huge problem that we're facing. And We've worked so hard at trying to landmark certain important buildings uh, like Dizzy Gillespie's house, like uh, Marie Daly, as I mentioned, she was the first African American to receive a, a doctorate in, in chemistry, from, was it from NYU? Yeah. From NYU. Um, the Dory Miller, uh, complex because that was the first African-American co-op and still still beautifully maintained. We've tried to landmark that and we always run into difficulty because the, 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 the association, the, uh, in, they are using a different uh, perception of what is, what should be landmarked. Um, either a Manhattan perception versus a Queens perception of what should be landmarked. And we've had great challenges in trying to get these important buildings. Right now, I think only um, Louis Armstrong's house is, is that a landmark? Right, that's, that's a landmark. A landmark. But that's, it's a federal, actually it's a federal landmark right. as well. So yeah. But getting locations, sites in Queens or even districts in Queens are extremely, extremely difficult. They, it's an automatic no. They do, they say no at a, at a point of procedure mm. and try to then get you to challenge it, the LDC, uh, Landmark um, District Council. So it's a very uphill battle and everything. And, and as Liz says, it appears to be that they have a Manhattan measurement yardstick to measure Queens, and that's unfair because you can't do that. I mean, Manhattan is Manhattan, Brooklyn is Brooklyn. Right, and the Queens. architecture is so different in Queens because it was settled by the Dutch. You see a lot of um, Federalist uh, architecture and architect houses that, as Carol, Carol Drew uh, Peoples mentioned in our uh, tour, houses built by the Dutch that are shaped like barns. And those, uh, those houses, we would like to get landmark, at least a few of them that typify the, the beauty and the, um, the skill of those who have created it. And we've had enormous difficulty in getting just those type of, not all of them obviously, but certain ones landmark because of what they represent uh, to the community and to the history of the community. Challenged us constantly. Constantly. So we, we continue to fight on, and Caroni Stompers Historical Preservation Society always encourages people to join us, um, like us on Facebook, join our organization, and help us, you know, try to maintain a lot of this beautiful history 
that we have. Um, we don't want to lose it. Once it's gone, it's gone. It's gone. How did the two of you get drawn into being part of the Founders Circle? Um, I mean, you mentioned this lovely story leading up to the, the idea of mm -hmm. the history, but how did you get pulled in? How did you get involved? Well, I think I mentioned earlier, we got involved, or at least I got involved, because three of founding members, the three founding members, not three of, the three principal founding members were part of a committee having these reunions every two years or so. And so they formed, they were on a committee within that, they called it the Double E Reunion for East Elmworth. Primarily, and but it was Corona East Elmworth in reality, and so they found that they had a similar concern and attitude in relationship to Corona East Elmworth and the importance of preserving. Because they actually moved away from New York, so they would see it when they came back and recognize the fact that things were changing and what was going on, and this isn't here, and et cetera, et cetera. So it was their idea, the three of them. Uh, that's uh, Carol Drew Peoples, Evelyn Seabrook, and Deborah Tyson. Deborah Tyson Scott, <laughs> make sure I mention that. <laughs> and so they were instrumental in joining us together. So I actually didn't really know Carol. I had known, heard her name and mentioned, and people had a lot of high regard for her, so, but I didn't know her personally. And Deborah, I didn't know personally either, even though there was a connection there through marriage that I didn't know. I knew the name, but I never, I hadn't met her. But Evelyn Seabrook, we were in kindergarten together at 143. Mm -hmm. So I've known her almost my entire life. And so she, she I wasn't, I was, I'm a little older than most of them except for Evelyn. And so I wasn't really going to the reunions. You know, I went, we used to have them in another organization. We used to have them, they used to have them all the time as well too. So I knew all the people who were organizing. I didn't even know these, so I didn't even go to the first two, I think it was. But Evelyn invited me. So I took time to go and that's, through that connection, that's how I became a member. So most, most of the members, and I'll let Liz speak on her own, but through some connection with somebody that was one of the principal founding members, that's my belief. So anyway, so that's how I got involved. And I wasn't 100% enthusiastic about it, but I, out of my respect and also seeing the things and how hard they worked, you know, I said I wanted to be a part of that because I was on my own becoming more aware of the importance of that community, the sister communities of Crowley East Elmworks. And I'm saying, what a great place to have grown up in. And I think everyone should know about this place for so many different reasons. So, yeah, know. so often they think about African American communities as um, challenging and rough and um, difficult and uh, it wasn't the way that we grew up and it was ours was 180 degrees the other way. Um, people were kind to us, we were kind to people, we grew up being solid citizens and just speaking our mind. So it. I, there's often with us who grew up in Coroni Stellenhurst area a bit of a disconnect between our growing up and other communities because it was not a harsh community. It was a kind, easygoing, nothing, no excitement, as I said, no drama. The police never came, the firemen never came, nothing, nothing ever happened there. So it was, it was kind of odd. Uh, I, my connection uh, is through the, our, our president, Carol Drew Peoples. Carol and I grew up in Dory Miller, along with her two sisters. Our parents were very close friends. 
Her father ran the, uh, among other things, he published the local newspaper. He was a newspaper publisher. My dad was an attorney and then a judge. And so together they were, along with quite a few other people in Dora Miller, the Solarchik family, the Kaiser family, many other families were activists. And I just want to add, the families, that, the few families that I mentioned, they were not all African American. They, as I said, growing up in Dora Miller, it was quite diverse. But um, they were all activists in terms of doing what's right and civil rights and getting children what they need, getting speaking up. And so uh, our parents, uh, Carol's parents and my parents, were lifelong friends. Um, and so Carol and I grew up together. Eventually, Carol's family moved to East Elmhurst. And so, and I guess I went off to college, and so we were not totally connected for a while, uh, but our families remained connected, and so we were. And so when Carol stepped up to the opportunity to uh, reinstate the Lieutenant Ken Slaughter Medal, which I wouldn't be surprised at Carol doing because that's her style. When she stepped up to do that, um, she called me and I, and I said, well, yeah, I'd be happy to, you know, join you. But knowing that Carol had more in, uh, on the back of her mind, it was way beyond the medal. And so when I agreed to join Carol, I knew I was joining something much larger than just a medal um, uh, opportunity. It was going to be much bigger because Carol's dad and Carol's mother were about the entire community. I happen to love history. Uh, Carol really, really loves history and maintaining and highlighting a history. And so it was an opportunity for both of us to work together. Carol, is, Carol Drew Peoples is nonstop, I would say. Mm -hmm. She is, um, moves forward. And so whatever difficulties we've run into, Carol just kind of pushes them aside and keeps going. That's her background, that's how her dad was, and that's how she was raised. So we're not surprised that we would move forward to a much larger um, mission in, in characterizing the history of Corona and East Elmhurst. So we are really follow her lead, and we have to keep up with her. <laughs> and, uh, and as Liz referred to earlier, there's a lot of diversity in the Corona East Elmhurst where we grew up. Now, I, when she referred to Mayberry, and I sort of say the same thing, particularly around Dory Miller, because yeah. that's how probably close to my perception of that area. So, but my family struggled. Uh, economic, again, it was nine of us and stuff like that. My mom and dad broke up uh, when I was probably about 12 years of age. And so it was a struggle. I've worked since I was 13 years of age and have not stopped since, and that's 60 years ago. So I've <coughs> always worked and always uh, struggled in terms of doing that. And a part of that, which was the part Liz probably never saw, was there were gangs in Corona, East Elmhurst. Uh, mostly in Corona, but there were gangs and they had differences, et cetera, et cetera. But having an older sister and an older brother, I knew everybody in every one of the gangs. And so that was sort of a protection thing for for me, but it was also a measure of respect because part of it was basically territorial. Even there was a long running thing between uh, the Italian American community in the uh, southern part of Corona and the northern part, which was mostly African American. But it was, wasn't really racial, it was territorial. And that's a distinction that you don't often think about. Because I have a couple of friends who grew up in South mm -hmm. uh, Corona, mm -hmm. African Americans, and they were in the gangs, in the Italian, Italian gangs. In the Italian gangs. They, they knew them, grew up with them. So 
And until he brought that to my attention, one particular friend, I wasn't even aware of that. And I think that's a distinction. But there were gangs and everything wasn't Mayberry Land over in Dory Miller, but it was... In Dory Miller. Well, yeah, I'm just saying, yeah, as it was in Dewey Miller. Um, because I remember this, this time, I was at a party. I was about 14, 15, and everybody was in the party. I mean, older guys, I was probably one of the young guys there. And early in the day, a good friend of mine, he had said that he had had a fight. We used to do this thing, sham boxing, I don't know if you remember that. You just box with each other. And you, and if you're not fighting them, you're just boxing and showing your skills. And he had, had done that with a guy that was in one of the gangs earlier in the day. And he had beat him. And the other guy was older and had a, supposed to be a more physical type guy than he was. So he, he had said to me, he said, I don't, he says, my nickname was Ronnie, he said, I don't trust him. I don't know what he's going to do. So we're all at this party. And we're out on the street, the party's over, and sure enough, this guy hits my friend, knocks him down, and starts kicking him while he's on the ground. And this guy is older than me, bigger than me, but I had told my friend, I said, don't worry, I'm going to be there, no, I'll let. So I had to do something, so I grabbed him from behind. And this guy knows me, knows my brother. And all these other guys, big guys older than me, Actually, my brother was there too, but he was like in a conflict. He didn't know what to do at first. So I grabbed this guy and hold him so he can't do anything. And one of the big guys grabs me by my collar and pulls me off of him. But he's not going to do anything to me because he knows that he can't do anything. He's got to protect me, but the guy that was beating up my friend was his buddy. <laughs> so it was sort of like complicated situation. But those things did exist and happen, and I never got hurt. My friend, you know, he eventually got up. He wasn't too badly damaged, but those are the intertwinings because everybody knew each other. And though they may have been in rival gangs or different gangs, there was a limit, there was a code, there was so far they could go. And this guy could not do anything to me because of that, that code, and it was a, a protective code. I knew about the gangs uh, because there were, even in North Corona, there were different gangs. Right, right. Um, but I, you know, because I had a brother, you know, two couple brothers older, you know, who would be out and about, you know, I would, I would hear about them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, I'm... Right, a little protected. <laughs> right. So, but it was an interesting time to grow up and it's incredible that... Can we take uh, a break right now? Right now? Oh. Uh, only, I want to adjust the mic. Okay, go for it. While well, it's still there. Should we mark the tape again? Oh yeah, we'll mark the tape. It's October 24th, mm -hmm. 2017, mm -hmm. part two, same segment, uh, same interview, part two. Clapping. Okay, so... Um, where we left off, you guys had shared some uh, wonderful memories about the community and the diversity there, um, and we were starting to talk a little bit about the formation of the of your society. So um, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the early meetings, some of the first conversations and debates about what the overall goals would be and um, how you would set priorities and tasks for the coming years. Um, just tell me a little about that process. Okay, well, we've been together about three years now. It was formed in July of 2014. Okay, so we just celebrated our third year, third full year, and we had the annual meeting this past weekend. And most of our meetings are via telephone conference calls. We have a board of directors and we have several different committees, and we've actually Throughout the three years, we've changed the names of the committees at, at various times in order to do the things we're trying to do. So, but there's a lot of outreach, there's a lot of initial or individual initiatives reaching out, for example, Deborah reached out to you 
in regard to that. So a lot of things are done based on persons being in particular committees as well as you know, individual initiatives. So it's it's been a lot. Uh, for example, I'm on one of the committees I'm on. It's, it's a, um, a a community committee, and one of the things we're doing is we just started an oral interviewing with um, people elderly in the community who have their own personal reminiscences. And so we just conducted that first one. We've interviewed individuals before, but this is the first time we did it on videotape about a month and a half ago. We visited churches, interviewed uh, ministers, pastors to help us get their membership involved in this project as well. So we recognize the importance of getting perspectives that people have. And we, we did about, I think we did nine people very recently on that. Only about 10 minutes each and we, in an attempt to find out how to do it best and you know how to have, whether or not to have a, a script or a series of questions or just to have them talk and what we did was just to have them talk. We had one person ask them a question in case they did drop a waffle or didn't have a, a whole lot they wanted to say to pull it out of them. So, so most of our, to answer your question, most of our meetings are via conference call because we only have, well, we just got two new board members, so we have about only five people actually living mm -hmm. in New York right now. It's five or six, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. And the rest live outside of, of New York, so conference calls works. And we have, sometimes I may have one or two conference calls every week for a whole month, so it, it varies. So it's a hard working, because every time you do one thing, there's something else to do. And so, and that also is what generates us, because as you find out more, you say, well, how did I never know this? And it drives you to find out more, because as Liz was pointing out, Carol is a very, she loves history, and she has very high research skills. And I'm always asking, well, how did you find out this? And how did you find out that? And finally, just recently, I was able to refer something to her that she didn't know about so she could do some more research. But it's, we tend to challenge each other to get better collectively for the benefit. And our motto is to preserve, protect, and promote Corona East Downwards community. And so, that's our mission, that's what drives us, and whatever it takes, if we have to form an ad hoc committee to make sure that doesn't fall apart, that we continue in our struggle and drive to make that happen. As a matter of fact, we had an ad hoc committee for a map. We, were, we won an award from, I forget what organization we won, okay. a thousand dollar award to have a map done of the Corona East Downwards. And, but we had to use this particular um, map guy. I, I can never remember the, the technical term for what a map maker is, but anyway. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> so, and we didn't quite get along. He had his own perspective on how he wanted the map to be done, and that's not what we wanted. So we formed a committee to, start. well, we would form the committee when we were working with him, and then we worked and working on finding somebody after him in order to do that. And we were going to have utilize, well, at least um, contact people, young people in the schools of, uh, that do map making, that do um, art and design and stuff. We started doing that. But we also, on our annual tour, this guy I was telling you about that knew my brother. He's a designer, art designer, he makes maps. And so he volunteered to do the map that we want, um, that we wanted to do. So anyway, that's how things develop and evolve from doing an ad hoc committee and so on and so forth to get our map done. I joined this committee a year after it was formed. And in the first few meetings, 
there was just a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion of so many things wanted to be done. We wanted um, a place to house all of our documents. We wanted to give tours. We wanted to go into the schools. We wanted to go into the churches. We wanted to uh, meet with the people in politics to get things done. It was so much going on. I, I was like almost dizzied by the number of things that were on the agenda to try to accomplish. Well, over time, like any organization, we were able to prioritize what it is we really wanted to do, what was our main focus, and what we could, uh, you know, put on the back burner, so to speak. What we really wanted to do was to, A, grow the organization so that more people would know about Caroni Stellenhurst Historical Preservation Society, and through that, we would have a, um, uh, a Facebook presence and we would become a nonprofit organization so that we could conduct ourselves in a certain way. All of this, you know, have, has to be done and somebody has to apply for the 501c3 and somebody has to fill out the documents and somebody has to be, uh, you know, organize the whole thing. And so a lot of that is, all of that really is done by uh, a few people within the organization. As, as Ferrant was saying, we don't all live in the area, so it's done with conference call and, and lots of uh, discussion and things happen, but those important things about becoming a nonprofit or nonprofit organization and prioritizing what it is we really wanted to focus on took probably six, eight, maybe even ten months because of all the different ideas that are being thrown about. Um, the one thing that we found out from being a 501c3 is that we cannot become, we cannot entertain politics, right? We cannot um, get involved with uh, political campaigns, which is important to know because sometimes that's where the money is in the political campaigns. But that being said, it, we don't want to misstep and so sometimes there's a lot of discussion about how to go about something because for many of us this is the first time that we've been in this type of organization. So all that to say that initially a great deal of discussion, then secondly we kind of narrowed it down, we prioritized, we realized what we had to do. We formed different committees to focus on areas that we wanted to focus on. Uh, as he mentioned, there is a uh, community, what's your, what's your committee called? Uh, community action. Community action. Uh, the particular area that I'm focused on is the education committee. I go into the schools, I speak to the teachers, we put on uh, different types of events to highlight the diversity within the, uh, within the community and to highlight the history in the community. Someone had mentioned that they wanted in uh, Black History Month, obviously we would focus on the history of Corona and East Elmhurst all the people that are well known within our own community so can, people can understand the value. We want to include parents because many of them have come from someplace else and they don't know anything about the community, even the grandparents. Uh, so the children may be third generation coming here, but the parents may have come here only in the 80s, uh, which, uh, which doesn't really give them an opportunity to learn too much. Um, especially if there are language issues, so we want to educate so that people learn about, so that people have a sense of the value of their community and so that they can pass that on and they have a sense of who they are. Um, we Obviously, certainly we want to include a great deal of the Hispanic culture that is part of the community now. And uh, there are other communities that have to do, other committees rather, sorry, that have to do with outreach and speaking to uh, any number of non-political people that can help us uh, either uh, 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 historical, in historical preservation or in landmarking, whatever we can do to, to focus on what our mission is, which is what um, Ferrance mentioned.
And so what started out as a lot of discussion and not sure, we kind of brought it in and focused it. And we are uh, much more streamlined and we run very well organized. Uh, everyone knows what their job is, jobs are. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and sometimes, what's that word that Carol used? Voluntold. Oh, yeah. You're voluntold. <laughs> and so I, we were voluntold. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's how. Uh, it's not a big organization in terms of who does the main work. There are probably uh, ten of us that really do a great deal of the work. And so we, we are kept busy uh, with our hand in a lot of different things. And and working for the benefit of the organization. So that's how it began, and that's sort of where it is is now. Thank you, that was a beautiful overview. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about all the research that you guys have been doing to pull together photographs, primary source documents. I also wanted to ask especially about the interviews that you mentioned. What were the goals of conducting these interviews, and um, what are some of the stories that really stick with you that you've heard? Okay, well I think the goals were one of the goals was we knew we wanted to do this, but we weren't sure exactly. I need to say you, you have you say the word interviews in there, otherwise we're not going to know what you're talking okay. about. So restart. Okay. What are the goals of these interviews? Well, the goals of the interviews were different. One of the goals was to get experience in doing it because we knew we wanted to do the interviews as a way of informing the community of that we existed, to let people know that what they had to say was important, that their memories were important, and as an opportunity to spread the word, and as an opportunity to get more people involved. It was all those multi-level things. And so, because the reality is that throughout the years, and though the earliest we probably go back in terms of our own minds and memories would be the early 40s, specifically, obviously a lot of stuff took place before that. But the people who are involved, that's as probably as early back as we go. And so there's other people that have memories earlier than that and how people got there. And one of the things I learned was that only out of about 25 people in the room, only two people were actually born in Corona somewhere that were there. And all of them had memories of when their parents brought them there, either from one of the islands, uh, Trinidad or Jamaica, or from Harlem or the Bronx, when they were four or five years of, of age. So that was some of the things that uh, actually came out. That's what I found most interesting. And also one of the things that Liz said, that the community, I never remember so much of saying that person was white or Italian or Jewish or whatever. They were just friends. We were, we were classmates. I mean, when I was in 143 in the kindergarten, it was, um, as I look back, it was probably half and half, probably uh, African Americans and um, white people as yeah, opposed to something else. I mean, it wasn't, I don't remember any Latino off no. the top. No. Right. So it was just no. black and white, so to speak. But you remember how mean the teacher was? Actually, I like most of my teachers. Uh, no, kindergarten teacher. Oh, Mr. Nelford? Yeah. Oh. See, we had the I same remember. one. Isn't that amazing? That, the same and that one. was. She well, was, my, yeah, that was. She was mean. Seventy years ago. And and I and I, what, I don't know what background she was. Dinafo. She must have been Italian. Maybe. I guess I don't so. Know. Right? Yeah. But we don't remember differences among people. But <laughs> right. Right. so so we had a. I sort of got off track here, but <laughs> in in terms of why we were conducting these interviews and what we got got out of them. So I think we learned a lot that we need to, we got a little criticism because some people found out afterwards and wanted to know why they weren't invited. That was one of the things we learned, so we have to be more inclusive in terms of making sure we invite folks. And 
you know, maybe having a script, do fewer people and give longer interviews, that sort of thing. So um, there's one person there that didn't want to be on camera, so he was speaking with him and his brother was sitting like we are, but he made sure the camera wasn't catching him because he had this aversion. I've known this guy since I was in junior high school, and I never knew that until he was doing the interview. I'm saying, what's with that? But that's the way he felt, so we respected that. So he was sitting next to each other with his brother. And he actually did most of the talking. <laughs> his brother's on film, but he did most of the talking. <laughs> so that was uh, interesting. So, we're, you know, we're learning a lot. Just being out there, that's one of the thrills for me, you know, I'd much rather be out there in, in the community. Also this past weekend, because we had a very eventful weekend, Friday, we, I don't know if you heard about the Giant Rock, I guess you did, okay. Right across from LaGuardia Airport is a strip, it's Dittmar's Boulevard, and that's where all the hotels are for the airport. And so we all as kids, used to visit this giant rock. And I'm talking about giants. Mm -hmm. And it was so big and so deep in the ground that these two hotels tried to blow it up so when they built their hotels. And they couldn't blow it up because it was too far down in the ground. So what they did, and unbeknownst to the community, they call this rock the, black, the pet rock. And so right now, the top of it isn't, in terms of the way the ground is graded, you only see the top part of it. Maybe the top part is maybe as big as this room. And it's maybe another five feet higher. So it's still difficult to climb up. And if you weren't skillful, you couldn't get up on this rock. I remember asking somebody the other day at this event, and she said, well, I could never climb, I would, my, Brothers used to always tease me, but I couldn't get up on the rock because you had to oftentimes get a running start to get up on this rock. And it was like in the forest. It wasn't just clear out there. It was a lot of trees around. And well, and another guy was telling me his brother used to jump from a tree. And I don't know how he did that, but <laughs> that's what he said. So anyway, the community was outraged when we found out that the hotels had named this the Pet Rock. We don't know where that name came from. So other people who are in contact with our organization outside of geographically New York uh, learned about it and so they contacted us and, you know, well we knew about it but we never made a really big issue. Of it. But a, we started a petition to sign to get the name changed from the Pet Rock. As a matter of fact, it's in that our newsletter. It's in it, yeah, Okay. To what? To the Giant Rock. Oh. And so, as a matter of fact, the borough president was out there. The local assembly person was out there because they responded to us, said they would okay, they agree with us, they would redead it, and they built a whole new plaque to put out there. So we had a ceremony Friday afternoon. And it had about 50, 60 people there. Uh, and uh, people made speeches. Uh, Cal spoke. I, just, I didn't really speak. I just, we gave certificates to the two general managers of the hotel. But now they, they dedicated it and it's now called the Giant Rock. So the ball president spoke. Jeff Aubrey spoke. Very he's nice. an assembly person. So that's one of our recent uh, uh, victories. And it just shows how collectively when you work towards a particular thing, it, it can be done. And the response on the part of the general managers were, was pretty quick. They, you know, we, that's one of the reasons we gave them the certificate. It was heartfelt, what they did and the way they did it, all respect. Because one of the things, one of our criticisms was they never contacted the community about this. But, you know, that's kind of understandable. But they made up. So and so now it's called the Giant Rock, and that was one of the we preserved the integrity of the name of the Giant Rock because that meant a lot. Everybody you talked about that grew up in Coney somewhere knew about the rock, the Giant Rock, and spent people talked about they had picnics down there. 
with the, with the families. And because right below the black, the giant rock is the Grand Central Parkway, which is now multi-laned. There was a point in time there was only two lanes in either direction. It's, it's about four lanes now in either direction. And there was an area down there where you could sit and have picnics and grass. There was grass down there. You could have picnics down there. People talked about um, doing that. So it's a great victory for the community. It may seem not too significant for most folks, but I think it's very important. Well, it has mind. a lot of history, you know, certainly. It's, it's 10,000. The, the rock, they have a statistic saying that it's been there f over 10,000 years. It came in the um, ice slide or whatever from up north, ice age, yeah. How did you guys identify um, the first few sites that you wanted to get landmarked? And, you know, out of the, the many homes that were there, or the old buildings were there, how did you prioritize, you know, these, these are the ones we're going to petition for first? Well, do you want to? No, go ahead. Well, part of it is based on the research that was done, but some things we already knew. For example, I did not know Dizzy Gillespie's house was where it was. Okay. I didn't even know Dizzy Gillespie lived in the community. I knew Louis Armstrong because I lived a couple of blocks from him. Uh, and so I knew that, and I've been there myself to visit the house very, very is very historic. But I didn't know Dizzy Gillespie until I became a part of this this organization. And St. Gabe, St. Um, sorry, Lake Osiris Church, I used to go to church there every Sunday morning. And I would pass Dizzy Gillespie's house and I never knew that was his house. To go to church, I would pass his house. So that was one of the, so members in our society knew of that and so that was one of the things there. And it was common knowledge that he knew, that he lived there, even though I didn't know it, and that he owned the house, because I did the research and got the copy of the, the uh, deed and showing that he lived there, because that's what LDC wants. They want proof of these things that, you know, you just can't say you want to landmark this and this is the reason why. So they're teaching us to be even better at it than we uh, thought we had to be. So that was one of the reasons. Uh, Dory Miller, because so many jazz greats lived there, that that was sort of like a very obvious place to, uh, to look at. Malcolm X, a world-renowned person, uh, that's uh, another place. Ella Fitzgerald and her husband, um, Ray Brown, lived on Dittmar's Boulevard, right up from the airport. And, and so these are things which, and we can get information on that they live there, and we have, you know, documentary evidence to, to support it. So those were, uh, were the, in a sense, the easy places to do because of the, the, the names and notoriety of those folks. But also Marie Daly, who was the, as Liz pointed out, she's actually the first African-American woman to get a, a degree in chemistry. And she was, you no. Know, when we visited her house the other day, it was actually my second time because I checked out the houses. My aunt and uncle, or play aunt and uncle, because our moms and dads were close, lived right around the corner. I've passed her house thousands of times. Never knew she lived there. So, and when we have, again, documentary evidence to do that. So when we knew that based on research, some common knowledge and some research, we said, these are people we need to uh, promote and get their homes designated. Now, the pro we, when we contacted um, Landmarks, they said, by Marie Daly, they said something about we didn't have proof that where she went to school, and we sent them the proof. I mean, so one of the problems we had with them was the fact that some of the stuff we sent them, they never acknowledged, and we had already we had sent it to them. So we've, again, we're learning how to deal with this, but those are some of the reasons why we chose these sites. Ones that are very uh, obvious, and we shouldn't have a problem doing it, as long as we, they learn, to, they find it easy to say no to the things we give. 
and but those shouldn't have been so difficult. Rather than saying no, rather than saying, well, they should say something like, we need this from you, we need additional stuff like this and that. So they basically would say no to our um, proposals. But th those are some of the reasons. Um, and what are the benefits of, you know, going to the Landmarks Preservation Commission as opposed to trying to get on the state and national historic registers or, you know, why, why was that organization identified? What were the benefits that you were hoping to get specifically? Well, I would think it's more that they're local. In other words, if they won't do it or not give us some acknowledgement, why would the state, why would the federal government? I think it would be, they would ask the same question. Why are you coming to us when your local people are doing it? You know, and so, and again, to me, the big problem is that a different yardstick is being used to measure the significance. And so, for example, like Dizzy Gillespie's house, it's not the greatest looking building. It has two entrances. Um, because a lot of times corner properties are made in, in, I think all over New York City, that they have two addresses. A lot of people don't know that. And they actually have two entrances. One on the street side and one on the avenue side. So it had two addresses. It only has one block and lot number, but it has two addresses. And it's not the most beautiful building. And so it doesn't have the architectural necessities, you wouldn't pick it out for its architect. But it's significant, here's this one of the greatest musicians uh, the world has known that lived there for a significant part of his life, him and his wife, his family, because other relatives, it's a, actually a three-family house. So, uh, and it's important to the community, so why not? And so saying no has to have significance to it, not just, hey, no, that gives some in integrity, credibility to the community that's uh, recognizing that. So that's how we see it. It's only going to come from us because there's, there's other s historical societies in Queens, but they have not paid a whole lot of attention to Corona Assembly. There's a Flushing one, there's a, a Queens Historical Society. I think there's one in Long Island Newtown. City. Newtown, right, that's another one. Okay, so there's, so we don't want to be dismissed. We want to acknowledge the history, the architecture, because there's a significant architect. Uh, Saint, uh, Later Saul's Church was built. You know, uh, now 100, the new structure was built 117 years ago. You know, a beautiful church. Mm -hmm. You know, I just found out about the synagogue, the, uh, uh, the North, Side, uh, North Side Hebrew Eagle. Temple. It was a synagogue. Mm -hmm. It was built in 1920. I've only known it as a church because it's now a church, but it was originally a synagogue built for the synagogue. And so, I mean, that, to me, in my own personal mind, that's one of the spots I think is because the architect is great. They can't deny it for his architecture. That's, for example, you know. And then now it's another church. So, my the point is that the reason for doing is the obvious reason is that we love this community and it needs to be remembered in a significant way. And that's the importance. And again, educating people so they don't lose sight, so young people can know the significance of where they live. You know, imagine somebody living in Dizzy Gillespie's house and they probably don't even know. So. Um, you probably aren't the only historical society in Queens to have noted the difficulty with getting sites in Queens landmarks specifically. Um, do you have a sense for why, what sets Queens apart in the mind of the LPC? Um, you know, what are the challenges specific to Queens for getting these sites landmarked? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure because it's, um, 
it, it feels as if the value is not there for the people who are doing the landmarking. They look at, let's say, a, uh, a structure that, as I said, may look like a barn built by the Dutch in 1918, and they say, huh, so? And, but, uh, and, or looking at, like, uh, Dizzy Gillespie's house, and they'll say, oh, well, it's not really looked like anything. You know, it, maybe it doesn't meet their criteria for, for sensing the quality of a landmark structure. That, that's all I can understand about it. Um, and as you mentioned, they're using a different uh, yardstick. Uh, structures in Queens are younger, for the most part, than the ones in Manhattan. This being settled earlier. They're younger, and the construction is different. They don't look like this. Um, they weren't, you know, Teddy Roosevelt didn't live in it, you know, it, it just doesn't have the cachet of that many of the structures in, in Manhattan do. And also, there is not the, um, the power behind getting these things landmarked. In New York, you have Manhattan, you have a different power structure that is, can put not only resource, but political power behind getting things resource, uh, getting things landmark. And maybe not, there's just not that level of resource in Queens to do that, because all the others have had difficulty as well. Yeah, I, I think Liz hit the nail on the head with all those uh, different reasons. And just the, I'll add, just the physical structures, you know, if you have a, a massive building in New York with creative architecture and historical architecture, and nobody lived there. <laughs> right. It has significance. In Queens, they want everything there. The person, the architect, and all the documentary evidence, the political support, you know, and so in a neighborhood that people often struggle just to make ends meet, they don't have a, a, a whole bunch of impetus to say, Dizzy Gillespie's house, so what? I don't, I don't know who Dizzy Gillespie was, is, or whatever. I need a place to live, okay, and feed my kids, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, community's political will is not significant, nor are the politicians, because they have other things. It would be on the back burner. Uh, whereas the level of community involvement, if you will, in Manhattan is just totally different. There's a lot of power in Manhattan, as Liz pointed out. They can, huh? And money. And money, yeah. So they can get done. And the LPC can just say, no. And there can be a structure in Manhattan that is, let's say, I'll pick just, uh, so, let's say in Harlem, that a person who lives on the Upper East Side will say, yes, that should be landmarked. And they have no real connection to the community, but they feel that it should be landmarked. In Queens, you probably won't have that crossover. It's going to be people from the Caroni Stellenhurst area that will want something landmark and not somebody coming from Maspeth that says, oh yes, that thing should be landmarked in Corona Stelmhurst. It, it, it's, a, it's a different kettle of fish, really. That's a very good point. And one of the things we're trying to do is to develop relationships with the other uh, historical societies in, in Queens. And we recognize all that all the time. The two walking tours we've had, people, um, speak up about the same sort of situation and problems. And you know, and in attending functions with the uh, HDC, because we're one of their six to celebrate uh, uh, honorees for this year, that, I mean, the energy and the passion that people at these meetings have, and it's almost like 
Queens is a forgotten borough. I mean, and they themselves recognize, I mean, they're, they're not the opposition because they're actually of the support. But when you see that, and then if you have a, the biggest event we probably had, well, we've had a couple. This was our second walking tour. We also had a, with a bike initiative. Queen's Bike Initiative, we did a bike tour as well. And so, so you may get 30 or 40 people involved in looking at these things, or at least being a part of, but when you come to Manhattan, you have a couple of hundred people with political contacts, connections, and, and when they say jump, they ask how high, whereas when we say, <laughs> Jones, they said, get out of here. Talk a little bit about the six to celebrate. Oh, okay. Well, that was a, a big thing for us for HTC, and they've given us a tremendous amount of support. Huh? I think, you know, do you know what the six to celebrate? Well, for oh, the record, go ahead. Okay, yeah, okay. Well, six to celebrate, the Historic District Council every year awards six societies, I'll say for recognition of the work that they're doing and in terms of preserving and promoting uh, historical homes, preservation, uh, buildings, districts, so if you will. So we were one of the awardees for 2016. And so part of that, they, our two walking tours, they were supportive. They were, well they actually put on a walking tour for us. And they taught us how to do, help teach us how to do this other one, which they've also fully supported. They always have somebody at our tours as well, in terms of supporting us. They, we, we get a grant from them for the tour, for both tours. We got a grant from them to use for whatever you want to do for doing our website, help us doing our website or whatever. And also we get put in a booklet that uh, they produced the booklets for whatever society that was on it for that particular year. And it's six societies every year. So they, it's a tremendous work. We stay in contact with them all the time. They are probably the most supportive of all the organizations that I've come with. I mean, they, they came out to our annual meeting last year and gave a presentation. And they also often have educational programs and we've attended many of them. In fact, Deborah attended one the other day. I think they have four this month. We're not sure we can make, we're not making all of them because we missed the first one. It was quite an honor to be, to be noticed by uh, HCC. Right, and yeah, yeah thank you Liz, because that, it, it was, it was a great thing for us. And so we at attended where we received the public recognition of being mm -hmm. awarded that. So, so yeah, it was a very good honor. And you were there? What are your memories of being there? I, I was not there. I, I was not there, but I know that you were there. You were there. Yeah, I, I'm in Queens. I have <laughs> some flexibility. You use the boots so, on the ground. <laughs> so I try to uh, attend as many as I can. What do you think about the uh, the Queens marking system that started up of just, you know, Queens recognizing that it's not getting the landmarking, it's not getting the recognition, and so sort of getting together to make its own little Queens marks? Well, I like it because I think, and I don't know a whole bunch about it because I just recently became aware of it, but I think any time you do something, you have a, need to have a plan B. <laughs> particularly when you're facing forces and it and it helps to challenge what's what's being done or not being done it exposes the hypocrisy of it and at the same time it generates awareness of your community that you think those things that you think are important what do you think is important okay we think it's important and so I think that's a very good idea Okay. If you could actually say Queen's Marking in one of the sentences, it would be very helpful for the future. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, well, Queen's Marking is very, very important because 
we're saying we know we're standing up against the big guys and we welcome that challenge. We're not trying to get away from it. Uh, but we recognize the weaknesses of the process. And you have to challenge. If you don't challenge anything, it remains the same. Or it gets worse. Either one of those two. But it doesn't get better. So we, I think that's a, a very good way of dealing with the fact that the powers that be, for whatever reasons, and there's multiple of those reasons, we can counteract that. And so I think that's something that we can be put in. For example, I remember somebody saying to me, well, if Dizzy Gillespie's house doesn't get designated, speak to the owners and get them to get them put a plaque up there. Which we want it to be designated as a historical site, but that's, it doesn't stop that from being done in, per, in preparation for the, the larger picture. So you always, in my mind, need to have different ways of approaching it because uh, that may be an art of war technique, but anyway, it's, it deals with how you have to work with what you have and keep on moving. That's the purpose of the Queen's marking? Yeah, they're saying, you don't, if you don't recognize us, we're going to recognize ourselves. That's great. We don't have to wait on you. And you guys are still a, a relatively new organization. You've done a lot in the three years you've been active. And I was wondering, um, do you have any advice for other organizations that are just getting started? Any, you know, learning experiences, things like, oh, geez, definitely don't try that. <laughs> or something that you know is, is really valuable or really important. What would you say? Well, I think the, f the first thing that comes to my mind is to not be disheartened uh, by the pushback that you'll get. Because even though you may have a great idea uh, about uh, preservation, not everyone else has the same great idea. And not everyone else is interested in your idea. But if you feel that it is important, continue to push your idea and pursue what it is that you feel is important to your community. Because eventually, some part of that will be done. And with that little part that gets done, you can move forward and do more. But uh, initially, we were um, misguided by some others, even uh, people that we would have trusted, maybe in office and maybe you know, in other types of organizations. We were diverted, we were ignored, we were chastised for being too forward, for wanting too much. And with all of that, as I said, in part it's our, it's our training, our growing up, that says, look, we're not interested in the negative part, we're going forward. And that's really, that would be my suggestion, to just eliminate the negative and move forward. Anything else? Well, I was actually going to say that same okay. thing. Focus on the positive yeah. and to be passionate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to admit that I've always been a hard worker, I don't, you know, if something needs to be done, I say, well, if you, if, don't ask somebody else to do it if you're not willing to do it yourself. But to that, I would add that the work ethic of the people in our society set a new bar for me. In our organization. In our organization, right. Uh -huh. yeah. And so, and it's always, a ch I think people need to be challenged because that's how we grow and develop, and I have been challenged, and so I'm trying to meet that bar, and, I, and so when you, when you have good examples around you and you follow through with them, that's gonna make the, your goal easier, it's gonna make your organization stronger, and I think we have all of those things here. So part of that, what operates inside of me is that person it's not going to make me look bad. I'm going to work as hard as they work, okay? And so that's one of the things that has generated me, at least personally, in terms of that. But, so I think, but organizations are made up as individuals, and what we do is 
a result of that interaction, our own individual perspectives, and when you join them together and challenge each other in a respectful and positive manner and know that those other folks are as passionate as you are, that's the energy behind the locomotive and it's gonna, we're going to keep on moving it forward. I always kid Ferrant about the work that he does. You know what I always say, if you want something done, ask a busy man. He's the busy man and he gets it done. He does. He does. But um, uh, again, in any organization you have people who are sort of with you, really with you, uh, not sure they're with you. and. I, I don't say that you weed them out. I say that you encourage them to see why you're so passionate about what it is you want to do. And maybe along the line they'll say, well, actually, yeah, I, I can go along with that. And get those people who are kind of on the fence, um, they like the idea, but they're not sure what, what's involved, uh, to move along with you. That's the sort of um, marketing that we have to do within our own organization. And to use the skills that people have because they're best at it. We have our techie who does all that stuff and we have our speech writers, we have our speakers, we have our researchers, but each person uses the thing that they're good at and they get a lot of pleasure out of that. So, I, I, so that's another thing I would encourage. Use people's skills that they have. And uh, even if it's um, keeping things neat and orderly, use it. Right. And I, w I would add also that reach out to other organizations that have similar thoughts and ideas and work in unison with them. Find HDC. I mean, that was, that was a tremendous thing on our part. I forget who, which member of our organization did that. But you know, partners. You need partners. Yeah, partners yeah. You need help and you need ideas and you need to work with other organizations to the best that you can. It helps everyone. Right. And I think some of the things that we need to do as an organization, one of our weaknesses I would think is our, on the financial level. In other words, raising funds, getting support, getting grants, all those things, even building the membership and getting um, more dues paying members, all of that is part of that. And I think that's probably one of our weaknesses. So I would say to other folks that are interested, you also have to work on all those things. That's probably the hardest part in a continuing, even though we recognize it's always, a, always there, it's always the elephant in the room. We haven't let that stop us, but it moving forward with bigger and grander things, it can make it that much more difficult. Our board members are, uh, they give, they are members, obviously they're members, but they are assessed a, a, an amount each year that they're expected to contribute financially to the organization. So in addition to the hard work and people that we have, we, uh, they open their wallets as well. We're very proud of that. You guys have been very generous with your time. I only have one other question. Um, what is the plan, what is the repository uh, for all the research and the work that you have done? What are you going to do with the artifacts that you've found, with the interviews you've collected, and, and with your own records um, and research about these sites? We're well, looking for a spot. Yeah, that's one of our biggest goals is defining a location within Corona East Elmhurst that would house all of these things, the artifacts, the photographs, the memories, or, or whatever you call it, the films, you know, and, and that's also related to what I just said about the finances, is that that's one of our, that's on our wish list, and we're going to do that but we recognize it's a big wish and it's a difficult wish, but we know we're going to do that. And so that's what we're looking for to do, whether it becomes something that's donated or based on grants that we get, whether it's 
local, state, federal, whatever the case may be, we're going to be seeking out all of those in order to get that repository to do those things. So that's a part of the road that we're on, and we're certainly going to do that. And it's a big task, but we, we feel we're up to it. So we're looking around. There are um, some of the local public schools are interested in housing some of our memorabilia of the famous people who went to that school. Uh, there are other locations uh, that we hope to designate that will give us a floor, a room, a space for all of the documents that we have so that when we do have our annual meeting, we can have it in that location and have the, all the history as a background. A space kind of like this. <laughs> would be wonderful. Yeah, I like this. But, um, <laughs> um, for instance, uh, the elementary school that Ferrance and I and all the others went to, PS 143, uh, is interested in having a glass case of some of the famous people that went to 143. They have a, the medal that I mentioned, that my brother's medal that they give, it's now a plaque with his picture on it and it has each person who's received uh, the award uh, has their name on it from, I guess it started, we started back I think in 2013, we, 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 we redid, redid the, uh, the award and it's now a good sized plaque. They have that in a special place and they'd like to bring in more memorabilia from people who went to 143. And because of the, the evolution of, um, of people coming in and out, we're always trying to grab something new, something from the Hispanic uh, uh, community, something from the German community, something from, there are, I think I heard something like 53 different languages spoken in this one public school. And so if we can grab pieces of that to honor the people who are now coming in to that school, it would be a great, a great way to, um, to uh, educate about the, the variety of people within the community. There's another school uh, that was the old Tiffany, um, Tiffany Factory. Factory, and it's now become a public school, the Tiffany School and they still have Tiffany glass in it. And so we're trying to bring some, um, there are a couple churches that have Tiffany glass. And so we're trying to just corral a lot of different pieces and put them in places where people can really feel good about the fact that that's part of my community. That's, you know, that was here before I got here and it'll be here after I leave. So we are looking for a spot or spots and um, that's, sort of that's that's one of our priorities right now because we have a lot of history and a lot of information and um, we need to have a place for it. So that's that's sort of number one in addition to growing our membership of the Caroni Stelmhurst Community Caroni Historical Preservation Society dot org. <laughs> right, where people can join, go to our website and join and like us on Facebook. Guys, thank you so much. Is there anything that I should have asked you that you really wanted to talk about today? Not that I can think of. No, I think... Um, we really appreciate the opportunity yeah. and uh, the questions were remarkable. You made it so easy. Oh, good. That's great to hear. Well, thank did, you so did, much. Did you mention coming. anything about the uh, Queens Public Library? Did, no. About the... Um, oh, do you want to talk yeah, about they have a building that is... It's a, they own a building. They own a house that was, who lived in it was the person who created those stories called um, The Purple Crayon. The purple well, Harold, and the Harold and the Purple, purple Crayon. Crayon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Crocker Johnson. Crocker Johnson. And so his house is owned by Public Library, Queens Public Library. They're wondering if they should demolish it. And so we're hoping through community efforts that we can encourage them to make it a children's library with uh, to educate, to have children's performances, to and just connect it with a little walkway from the main public library rather than demolish it. And what a perfect building. And named after Harold and the Purple Crayons author. So we're hoping we're hoping to bring some public pressure to do that. And it's just amazing how easy it is for those who 
for example, the Queens Public Library, because it's a separate system from the Manhattan and the Brooklyn one, they're totally uh, separate, is that they're sort of dismissing us when we raise that, which oh, is yeah. not unusual. Again. It always happens. I mean, it's to be expected. So that's why we have to mobilize the community to fight that, because it's so easy for them to say, you're standing in the way of progress. We tear it down, we need a whole new building, and so on and so forth. That's what happens. So that's a fight we're getting ready to win. Right. So we're setting up a meeting with the right. president. The Crockett Johnson Building, Children's Museum, Children's right. International and, Library. And it's a, as Liz mentioned, it's a win-win situation. Yeah. And we're not saying uh, not to ignore the fact that that's one of the busiest libraries in uh, Queens, because it happens to be. So, but you have a dual purpose. It doesn't have to just be one way, and I think that's what often blinds people. It's my way or the highway, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we're challenging them. So that's, that's on our top to-do list as well. Guys, thank you so much for your time coming in. You have wonderful stories, and I really thank enjoyed you. talking to you. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Both of you, Ashley.